it's been said that if you don't like the service one week at a Unitarian Universalist church, come back the next week. It'll be completely different. <laughs> I think that's the worst first line to a sermon that I've ever written. <laughs> it's, it's okay to laugh here. The corollary to this, of course, is that if you really, really like the service one week at a Unitarian Universalist church, come back next week. It'll be completely different. What I'm, what I'm talking about here, what I'm beginning to get at, is a broad and generous approach to religious life and inspiration that characterizes us here in this Unitarian Universalist church. As a religious tradition, we do not draw from one text from one tradition, from one culture, or from one style. Our sources come to us from East and from West, from the ancient scriptures and from modern insight, from science and from poetry, from people of all races and from all places. Our music, week to week, might include Protestant hymns or pagan chants, classical or jazz, bluegrass or gospel, pop or anything. You can just go on with the list. As a preacher, and the worship ministry will, will tell you that this is the case, I actually plan out my sermon topics in a way that is intentionally mindful of variation and diversity. I try to find a balance between sermons that are political and spiritual, those that deal with outward justice, and those with deal, deal with inward transformation, those that nurture this, our beloved community and those that engage a broader concern for the world in which we live. This diversity, this breadth, I contend, is actually a theological statement and an articulation of an overarching commitment that our human diversity of religion and culture and worldview is a good thing, glorious and worthy of praise that no one part of our great human diversity holds a monopoly on truth, and that our differences are worth celebrating, that insight comes to us from a multitude of sources, and that this worldview, this worldview is generous and magnanimous and liberal, and that is good. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about humanism. Humanism is one of the major sources of understanding and inspiration for Unitarian Universalists. But in talking about humanism, I want to distinguish between two ways, two different ways of thinking about humanism. I want to talk about humanism as an ethic and contrast that with humanism as a demographic. Here is what I mean, a little bit of what I mean by an ethic of humanism. And to do this, I'm going to quote from the essay entitled Humanism from the new book of essays by the amazing writer Marilyn Robinson. She writes, Humanism was the particular glory of the Renaissance, the recovery, translation, and dissemination of the literatures of antiquity created new excitement, displaying so vividly the accomplishments and therefore the capacities of humankind with consequences for civilization that are great beyond reckoning. Having been at the center of learning throughout the period of spectacular material and intellectual flourishing, these Renaissance passions live on among us still, in expanded and adapted forms in the study of the humanities. Another um, source who I'll talk a little bit about later, Anthony Pinn, characterizes... Um, characterizes humanism as an understanding of humanity as an evolving part of the natural world, a commitment to individual and societal transformation, and a controlled optimism that recognizes both human potential as well as human destructive activities. So that is kind of this sense of an ethic of humanism. And so I wonder, though, is it ironic then, is it ironic then that the fathers of humanism were a group of faithful Catholic priests? The ethic of humanism, an ethic of broad openness to human possibility and to the capacities of humankind, actually, I want to insist, does not exclude people who believe in God. 
In this sense, all Unitarian Universalists are probably humanists. At least, I don't think I've ever met a UU who isn't also a humanist. But there's another way, another way of defining humanism that has less to do with an ethic and more to do with a demographic, by which I mean sort of a box that says these certain qualities are necessary for inclusion in the group. A demographic is what's created when we do a theological survey of the congregation, as was done about three years ago, um, and the survey showed that 59.3% of the congregation identifies with humanism. The demographic approach often evaluates based on dogma and equates inclusion with the possession or absence of a list of certain ideas dealing with the existence of God and so on and so forth. Under this demographic understanding of humanism, the humanist bona fides of someone like Erasmus, the Renaissance uh, thinker, is called into question. Erasmus was both a Catholic priest and the father of humanism. And so we ask under that sort of a demographic understanding, the idea of a Catholic priest also being a humanist is an oxymoron. But under an ethic, under an ethic, that's possible. The demographic definition of humanism has to do with differentiation, choosing sides, and drawing lines of separation. But there's other ways of definition. This schema, by the way, contrasting an ethic with a demographic, is borrowed from author Marilyn Robinson, who I quoted earlier. She actually uses these concepts to talk about Christianity, and she writes about a Christian ethic, a Christian ethic which she takes to mean loving, charitable, self-sacrificing, and generous, sort of a Christian ethic, and contrasts that with how uh, the demographic use, of the demographic way in which Christianity is often used, um, which is set on drawing a line of sort of who's, who's in and who's out. Thus, the irony that it's possible to speak of one's own Christianity in an unchristian way. But so too, so too is it possible, I think, to speak of one's own humanism in an unhumanistic manner. Marilyn Robinson, whose writings I hold in very high esteem, seems to me to be uh, like the, the definition par excellence of a Christian humanist. And I'm sure that there are both some Christians and some humanists who would scoff at such a term. That's an oxymoron. There's no such thing. Depending on who, though, is creating the demographic categories, there may be no such thing. But according to the ethic of each, the ethic of each, such an identity is both possible and real. My interest this morning lies in sketching a little bit of the history of contemporary humanist movements and drawing from this history certain lessons that we might apply to our living Approximately 10 years ago, I went back into my sermon files and I found that approximately 10 years ago, I gave a sermon called What's New with Humanism? And 10 years ago, I spent pretty much the entire sermon talking about the rise of the new atheist movement. Between 2004 and 2007, prominent atheists released a large stack of books with the purpose of waging kind of an aggressive denunciation of all religion and religious belief. The New Atheist Movement was led by Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, the late Christopher Hitchens, and Daniel Dennett, who as a group were later referred to as the Four Horsemen of the Non-Apocalypse. <laughs> and their books, with, with titles like The End of Faith and The God Delusion and God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, offered a no-holds-barred denunciation of religion. On the one hand, looking back at it now, historically, it is clear that, that, these, that these books, this, this atheist literature, literature was very much a product of, of its times. That, that at that time, what was really fresh in people's minds were the September 11th terrorist attacks, the Catholic child sex abuse scandals, the religious culture wars, with virulent homophobia and resistance to gay marriage in the name of religion, and the intertwining, 
of evangelical religiosity and politics within the administration of George W. Bush. And, and these factors all enabled and contributed to a strong rebuke of religion. At around this time, uh, actually in, in 2007, the evangelical polling group, uh, the Barna Group, actually did a survey of um, young people between 18 and 35 who were not religiously affiliated and asked this, this young group saying, when you hear the word Christian, what are, the, what are the first three words that come to mind? And their survey actually showed that the first three words that came to mind were anti-gay, judgmental, and hypocritical. And so, and so that, I think it's, it's, that, it's that sort of zeitgeist that enabled really the, the Dawkins and the Harris and the Hitchens books to, to, have the, um, to have the sway that they did. On the other hand, the writings of Dawkins and Harris and Hitchens were aggressive and nasty and juvenile. And, um, and that they're... Um, and that their really strong antagonism to extreme and fundamentalist forms of religion actually sort of bled over, and they were just as strong in challenging liberal religion. Um, they actually called out um, liberal Christians and, and liberal Jews and, and even Unitarian Universalists, saying that our practice of religion somehow enabled the fundamentalists to... to, to um, to do what they did, which is, which is an interesting critique and not one that I really, I don't think of myself in that way. Having Dawkins and Harris and Hitchens and comedian Bill Maher front and center as the loudest and most visible representatives within atheism actually posed a challenge for humanist communities. To put it bluntly, their rhetoric gave the impression that humanism is a tradition for angry straight white men. And several notable events within humanism led to an awareness that humanism had a real diversity problem within it. Witness the following headlines from the last few years. September 2011, Huffington Post. Does atheism have a sexism problem? BuzzFeed, September 2014. Will misogyny bring down the atheist movement? The Nation, September 2014, Atheists Show Their Sexist Side. October 2014 in Salon, Atheism's Shocking Woman Problem, what's, beyond the, what's Behind the Misogyny of Dawkins and Harris? And most recently, Quartz Online, February 2016, Brazen Sexism Pushing Women Out of America's Atheism. Some of this conflict, and some but not all of it, stems from contro controversial remarks made by Harris and Dawkins. Um, in an interview several years ago, Sam Harris was asked um, about the lack of women in visible leader, leadership positions within the atheist movement and responded that estrogen reduced the reasoning capacity of women. <laughs> which is, which is if for a man who believes in the supremacy of science... He seems rather ignorant of science. And when he was rightly criticized for making such a statement, his response was basically to say that it's not his fault that women don't understand his humor. <laughs> Similarly, um, just a few months ago, Richard Dawkins was disinvited from giving a major lecture at, a, uh, at, a, at an atheist gathering in the Northeast um, after a, a Twitter um, battle where he's, he went on Twitter to um, attack feminists. Um, so this is, this, is really, this is really interesting that, that we have the kind of the most prominent, the biggest, the biggest sellers also stirring up this, this question of diversity. And the questions of diversity go, go deeper than that. Um, contemporary humanism, there's also as many articles about contemporary humanism having a race problem as well. Humanist organizations tend to be almost exclusively white, 
Um, and to give, you, to give you an idea of that, um, Anthony Pinn, who I'm going to talk about in just a second, um, in his book on African-American humanism, uh, Pinn says that, that actually um, Unitarian Universalism is a much more welcoming and inclusive home for people of color than you'll find in most exclusively humanist organizations, which is, a, which is an interesting... Um, which is an interesting thing. Nobody is doing more interesting work on the intersection of race and humanism than Anthony Pinn. Um, Pinn holds a PhD in religion from Harvard and in 2003 became the first African American to hold a named professorship at Rice University, um, which is both an accomplishment and, and somewhat shocking that 2003 it took that long. Pinn has served on the board of the Meadville, of Meadville Lombard, one of our two UU seminaries, and has written extensively about the intersection of African American religious experience and forms of humanist thought. In his brand new book, Humanism Essays on Race, Religion, and Popular Culture, Pinn distinguishes between two forms of humanism evident in African American culture. The two forms he calls shadow humanism shadow humanism and naturalistic humanism. Shadow humanism, according to Pinn, is present in the social justice concerns of the black church and in its this-worldly emphasis on community empowerment. Pinn recalls one of the favorite sayings of his grandmother, who said, God has no hands but your hands, no legs but your legs. Shadow humanism, Pinn writes, does not, uh, does not exclude religious language does not exclude theological language, um, but finds a positive and uplifting message about humanity within it. Pinn writes that this shadow humanism is evident within the African-American religious experience from the liberation songs sung in the Hush Arbor during the days of slavery through the civil rights movement. Pinn would probably say that the Moral Monday movement here in North Carolina and the prophetic work of William Barber is a continuing articulation of that shadow humanism. According to Pinn, the other form of African-American humanism is naturalistic humanism. And if shadow humanism is evident in spirituals, Pinn writes, naturalistic humanism is evident in the blues and in cultural productions that jettison traditional metaphysical formulations dependent on notions of the divine and deal instead purely with the messy business of human interaction in the world. Pinn writes about movements like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Black Panther Party as political and social movements whose emphasis was entirely, he claims, entirely this worldly. So what's new with humanism? What's new with humanism? I've heard several people say that within the African American community that humanism today is most evident in the Black Lives Matter movement. That Black Lives Matter focuses exclusively on imminent, this worldly concerns and has arisen separate from and exterior to power structures of the church. So I had this um, experience, this fascinating experience um, going down to Raleigh for HK on J uh, in February. How many, how many people were there? There's quite a few. Um, you had very much two, two movements there, and this, and this distinction was, was evident. Um, the NAACP, the, the moral movement led by William Barber, is an evidently religious movement. The leaders overwhelmingly tend to be clergy, the speakers tend to be ministers or imams or rabbis or priests. The moral calls are made with reference to the Hebrew prophets, to the liberation of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, and to the teachings and ministry and liberation of Jesus Christ. The message grants authority to the transcendent power of God, and the concerns, the concerns, while humanistic, are expressed through a transcendent medium. 
And so we were there at HK on J, and it was interesting because as the speakers were giving invocations, a sort of a parade of the Unitarian Universalist minister, the Catholic priest, the Jewish rabbi, the Muslim imam, speaker from the Sikh community, the Protestant pastors gave invocations. The Black Lives Matter group was really interesting. They turned and faced inward and did their own, um, did their own speaking to each other at the same, at the same time. It was, a, it was a movement with no privileged place for ministers or imams or rabbis. And the moral call was made without reference to the Bible or the Quran or any religious text whatsoever. The message inside the group made no reference to any transcendent power beyond our own human capabilities. The concerns were humanistic and the language exclusively humanistic. I believe as Unitarian Universalists that we are called to do the work of breaking down walls, to do the work of breaking up the boxes that people are called, that people are put in. We're called to do the work of resisting distinctions in whatever form they arise in our culture. That can be a religious who's out or who's in. That can be a which bathroom are you supposed to use. That can be a are you a citizen or not. That our religion, our overarching commitment is this generous, magnanimous, dare I say, liberal view of the world that doesn't accept an either-or, but insists on a both-end. It's ours religion to say that Christian humanism, that's not an oxymoron. Yes, you be you. Go for it. Religion that says all are welcome. All have a place. This work of mending divisions, bridging separations, breaking down barriers, tearing down walls, overcoming distinctions, is our religious work, our soul work, our humanistic work, all of it to do. Amen, and thank you.